Danny, for you going through this in the big seat for the first, obviously you've been to drafts, you've been part of the, the brain trust, but to be the guy with the final decision, what is this feeling like for you now as we're a week out from getting to Nashville? Well, I, I don't know any better, so I guess it's it's my first time. Um, it, it's It's been exciting. Um, there's been been a lot of activity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited. It's first draft, uh, having a chance to have uh, two first round picks uh, on top of it. I, I think it's uh, it's good. You can you can kind of feel the energy too from our staff and you know our amateur scouts. Uh, you know, having to dig in a little deeper. Uh, you know, you prepare going into it thinking about the seventh pick, but now all of a sudden. You know, you're telling them, well, you gotta, you gotta know the list all the way down because uh, there's might be something different. And then it was good because they got a little bit of prep. You know, they they were in town. Uh, we were together in Buffalo. They were in town after that, so um, it, it forced them to dig in a little deeper for for their list, so you can find uh, or, or feel the excitement on their part. Danny, right. did you uh, reach out to get an interview with Matt Bamichkov uh, before the draft? Uh, I, I believe we'll have the chance to meet with him, yes. You mentioned the calls that are coming. Is there, you know, with, with 7 and 22, it's some pretty good ammunition. Is there a chance you could move up? Or if you do move, would it be more likely that you would move back and sort of stockpile? Honestly, I've, everything's on the table. We've had uh, discussions in, in both directions. Um, you know, it, it would have to, it would kind of have to make sense. Um, I guess for both sides, whoever's involved, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not taking anything off. But I, I would think that if something like that were to happen, it, it's probably going to be on the draft floor, depending how the board falls uh, during that day. Just the way it, oh, sorry, just the way it always works. We have layers of players at certain levels. Obviously, if a player is falling to a point where you think you have a chance to move up, and you feel that the price is worth it to move up, then we'll try it again. If our list falls quickly, and we feel we can move back and potentially get the same player a little bit later, then we'll try to do that. So that's what you're trying to do and trying to evaluate on the draft floor. Brent, there's a lot of excitement around this draft, not just because of the top guys, obviously, but just in general about the depth. I guess what's your evaluation of the draft? Do you agree that this is a stronger than average draft? And if so, you know where do you see kind of the drop off where it becomes more of a normal normal group? Well, I think it's pretty well known at the top of the draft. Uh, obviously, you have uh, some elite players, and uh, but we, you know, it has been known as an, a deep draft. I think you go right through the second round. I think there's different layers that we've identified. Of you know, like I just said, there's different layers as far as guys that we feel are. Uh, potentially top six forwards or you know whatever. Um, there's players that we're confident are going to play, but might not have the same ceiling. So those are all the things we evaluate. Um, but there, are, it is a deep draft, I think, and we're confident we're going to get a good player at 22. And and if we add more picks, um, you know, we're confident we're going to get some good players there throughout the early rounds. And and I get our guys spend a lot of times trying to identify guys for late round picks as well. So. Right, there was a buzz around this draft is it's a lot of quality forwards. <coughs> Some quality defensemen, maybe not as many as the forwards. Yeah. Um, when you factor in though some of the uh, some of the Russians beyond Michkov, a couple of them are defensemen, maybe a forward or two. Do you feel that there, there's sufficient depth throughout the top round that you feel comfortable with being able to get a quality player? Pretty much, you know, pretty much wherever wherever you might be picking. Yeah, are you talking specifically defensemen or for? Oh, well, just 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 in general. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the questions is about defensemen, but one is, but uh, so I, let me let me phrase it better. Um, when you factor in the the Russians beyond Michkov, um, and they're all kind of X factors because what's involved in bringing guys over, um, do, do you feel that there, there's an opportunity maybe the guys will fall to you or in the 22 range who might not otherwise be there? Uh, possibly, yeah. No, we, we've spent a lot of time. Uh, we're like every other team as far as the Russian players. It's a good year in Russia. Unfortunately, we weren't allowed to be there uh, personally, but Kenny Hudikov, our Russian scout, of met with these players. I've spent a lot of time watching them live. We've spent a lot of time watching them video. So there are some quality players uh, from Russia that are going to go high in this draft, probably before we pick, uh, maybe even at 22. So uh, that's an evaluation. Obviously, we, we'll, we'll put our list together as we see fit. But um, for whatever reason, it is a strong year in Russia, and, and we'll have to make a decision. And do you think the depth of defensemen specifically might be a little bit better than no, I don't think so. No, it's, there are some quality defensemen, I think, in the first round. But I, overall, I don't think it's a real deep draft for defensemen, though. Danny, as, as we 
you know, around this time, there's a ton of trade discussion with other teams. When we talked to Kevin Hayes at the end of the season, he said he probably would learn whether he'd be a flyer or not around the draft. Like, where do things stand with Kevin? Have you had a lot of dialogue with other teams? Nothing has really changed on that. Um, we still value Kevin. We still think he, he can help. Um, you know, it's it, it's tough to, to tell at this point. Um, you know, he's a big six foot five centerman. They're they're not easy easy to find, and it's not like uh, free agency is really deep there with with centermen. So um, to replace him would would be tough as well. So um, you know, right now my stance hasn't changed on that. Dan, uh, you mentioned in one of your press conferences that the left side was something that you wanted to look at. Um, is it practical to try to get something there through the draft because of the fact that it might be a, a yeah. year or two or free agency or trade? Is that something you're looking at? He, well, certainly not at the top of the draft. Um, you know, you got to be careful to you know be- take the best player available for us. Um, that's going to be the goal. You have to be careful because that player is probably not going to be uh, here for another few years. Things can change by that time, you know, in, in your lineup and your roster. So um, I want to be careful with trying to push for uh, just strictly one position uh, at the top of the draft. Danny, obviously um, a lot of this is going to depend on how the draft falls ahead of you guys and whatnot, but you know, there's, of course, a lot of talk about Mitch Hoff, you know, that he could potentially be there at seven. Does the fact that you guys now have an additional first, does that maybe give you, you know, more of a willingness to take a swing because you have that second pick? I, I don't want to see it that way. Um, I, I still want to take the best player available for us at that moment, not thinking, okay, now I, you know, because I have that other pick, it, it changes what I'm going to try to do. Um, I, I'd rather we go with the same mindset you know, take the player that's going to uh, be the best player for us, depending, uh, you know, where we're at in the organization. So uh, I, I'm not looking at it where, okay, because we have different picks, that's going to change how we approach uh, uh, number seven. I guess kind of as a follow-up to that, you guys historically, you know, regardless of the GM, have been a pretty intangible, focused organization in the draft in terms of valuing character, in terms of valuing personality of the player mm-hmm. with Mitch Koff, you really by your own admission haven't really had a chance to speak with him to the depth that you would normally at that you know especially high up in the draft yeah does that give you pause given the fact that you guys so have oh, character yeah we're, we're we're trying to get as much information and and we'll spend a little bit of time with him and we'll try to get as much information as we can and make our decision after that we what? do a lot of background we do talk to players on his team we've talked to coaches our staff have talked to so we've done a lot of our background and we'll spend time with him and his family and you know get a comfort level and and then make a decision appropriately what are the defining characteristics in these players that you guys are looking for whether that be like certain skill sets or you know as mentioned the, the character and the leadership potential well, there's, I mean, we want the six foot six centerman that can skate like the wind, hit everybody on the ice, and score 50 goals a year. Um, there's not too many of those. Um, but, you know, hockey sense is an important one um, for us, uh, character is an important one. Um, you know, you, you could go down the list. There's lots of traits, and there's no perfect, perfect player um, out there. So uh, you try to find. The, the players that maybe have the most of those those traits, uh, it could be physicality, speed, uh, or important hockey sense. We talked about skill, level, uh, character is a big one. Um, and we're we're at the obviously uh, kind of a I wouldn't say the start of a rebuild, but we're pretty early on in our process. So there's there's a lot of things that we need. Uh, that's just a reality. So uh, we'll try to find you know the best player for us at that at that spot. Along with that. A lot of the additions that you've made recently have, in my opinion, focused a lot on the development of a player and, and making sure that they have all the tools that they need in order to maximize their potential. Do you see that as um, another way to look at these players and not only identifying their strengths but their weaknesses and knowing that you have the resources within your own organization to help turn those into strengths? Yeah, I, I feel that you know the, the draft for us is is going to be critical and the next step of that of that is player development um and 
you know, we've had a, a lot of people there to to help in 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 that department. That it's something we take very seriously. Um, try to help these players become the best players they they can be. So, uh, adding Patrick Sharp and John Leclerc, they're ha they're going to have a big say in that. And I, uh, that's I, I'm really excited about the, those two guys coming aboard to kind of show what what they've been through and. You know they, they've they've had a an interesting career path. Um, you know I had the chance to see John Leclerc myself as a young boy uh, in Montreal when he started, and then it wasn't an easy uh, road for him. Yeah, he won the Stanley Cup early, but they they were pretty tough on him. And you know he gets traded to Philadelphia and became a superstar here. That was pretty cool to see. Look at Patrick Sharp, what he's been through early in his career. Uh, I think that's tremendous experience that they'll be able to share with uh, with our young guys. Uh, they haven't had the, the the cleanest and easy path to to winning Stanley Cups and being star players. So I think it's it's pretty cool that they'll be able to share that with with young players. We'd like to, yeah, we'd like to. That's not a secret. We'd like to add, and um, like Brent said, there's there's some depth um, in, in this draft. Um, so if we have the chance, yes, we, we would like to add. And in that gap between, uh, was it 22 and 87? Brent, we know uh, Danny's been involved with your guys' drafts, I think, since 2020. But this is the first time he's been GM. Can you maybe explain the, di the dynamic between you and Danny and kind of who has the final say or how much Danny will be involved yeah. in getting his voice in there? Well, it hasn't really changed much, to be honest with you. Danny spent a lot of time. We've been on the road together a lot over the last couple of years, evaluating the same players. So we, even when he took over, he had a pretty good idea where we each stand on, on especially the players at the top of the draft that he was aware of. And uh, we have a similar philosophy. So we've he has some different ideas of approaches that he's addressed with our staff and our scouts and what he thinks. And um, But it, it's it's been pretty... Pretty as far as their amateur scouting side, it's been pretty easy transition to be honest with you. I guess kind of as a follow up to that, and this is to both of you. Over the last few drafts, there has kind of been, and Brent, you've spoke to this. It's kind of been a little bit of a of an organizational pivot in terms of taking maybe bigger swings. You know, Cutter Gauthier is, is a really high upside player. Even Samu Tuomala, mm -hmm. you know, with the skating ability, mm -hmm. has high upside. Are you guys still maybe leaning towards that? You know, looking to maybe take a little bit more risk to potentially have the higher reward. In some cases, yeah, I, I think you got to measure it. Um, it depends where you pick too. I, I think there's certain players. There it depends what the risk is. If the risk is character and lack of drive or lack of compete, that's a big risk for me. And those are risks that tend to work against you down the road, even if they do play. Uh, but the risk, if it's just a player needs to get stronger or there's skating issues that our staff feel like it can be addressed or whatever the issue is, we that's a thing that we can help with and, and fix. Um, then we're willing to take those swings if, if we think the ceiling's that much higher for a particular player. Brent, Connor, Connor Bedard aside, can you talk about the strength of the WHL class this year? Uh, yeah, it's actually a, it's been a good year out there. Um, there's goaltenders, there's a couple defensemen, there's some centermen. Um, you know, between Jaeger, Danielson up the middle, then you got uh, Molendyke, you got Bjarnason in net, um, Hanzik is a big check playing out there. So it's a good draft. It's been a good year for the West, and they're spread out throughout there. So we spent a lot of time out there in the prairies. Brent, um, th there's four kids from the U.S. national team program that could go in the top 15 even. When you look at where those guys project, and, and the 2019 group is sort of the class for that program, do you project you know, these guys in this year's group, if we're talking five years from now, do they project to be at that level of like a, a Zegris, a Caulfield, a Boldy, a York, you know, uh, or, or will they be close to that if they if they continue on their progression? Possibly, yeah. yeah. They're, they're different different players. Um, I guess this group is probably a little smaller, you could say, uh, with the exception of Hughes. Or, but this group is, uh, you know, that line especially has, has been dynamic. Uh, they've torn apart the USHL. They, I think they've all broken records, I think. So... Um, and each are different. Perot's an elite hockey sense guy, uh, obviously not a very big body. Smith is highly skilled, makes plays, sees the ice so well. Uh, Leonard's more of a power guy, but drives. He's got skill himself, speed. And then Moore's on a second line, which normally a lot of years he'd be a first line center. So it's just the way it is. Um, but it, it was an exciting group, and uh, you know, obviously it's fun to evaluate top players like that. So.
but there, to, to compare that that yeah. group is pretty special. Is there a danger in, in overvaluing small sample sizes like the, the under 18s? High profile. Yes, I will answer your question. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to that uh, that line you mentioned for the U.S. National Team Development Program, obviously you guys aren't going to give away your secret sauce here, but yeah. what's the risk there of, you know, maybe it turns out that two of those guys are really carrying the line and one of the guys is a passenger, and how do you guys try to determine, you know, whether maybe one of those guys is overrated and and one of those guys might be underrated and whatnot. Well, in some cases, I think you're referring to Leonard probably, but um, you watch the games when he's on a different line and see how he drives the line. Um, in other cases, you watch, you know, we've seen these kids for not just this year. We've the, those, These kids have been high-profile players for a few years now, so they've been on the radar. Um, but, again, you know, you see when Leonard is playing with Moore or you see when Pro's on a different line, you can – We've seen these guys. We have guys almost at every game there. It's just one of the most overscouted teams in the history of hockey, probably. I'm um, curious, you know, obviously outside of the, the top two or three, all these guys are going to go back for another year of junior college, whatever it is. But what's the logical time frame, especially with number seven, that you could see whoever you get in a Flyers uniform? Is there – Could it, do you want somebody who could be more ready in a year, or are you okay with they go like, – like Cutter's doing two years, three years, maybe in college? We want the best player three, four years down the road. Oh, Dan, I'm not going to speak, but I think we're agreeing on that. It's it's not a rush as far as who's going to be play first. Um, there's a lot of guys that will play sooner, but you know, it's, who's going to become the best NHL player is our focus. I, I agree with that. It's 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 about the development of the player. I, I'm not worried if it's three, four, five years down the road that they become the best they can be. I'm not worried about next year or the year after. In an ideal world, would you guys like to? Well, we're uh, w again, if if possible, but um, you know, it's it's pretty exciting what what's going on and uh, um, you know what's coming up, not just with the Flyers but the farm system too. Um, you know, it's uh, we ha we have some good goalies coming up, um, guys that could turn out to be high end. So, um, yeah, we, we'd like if possible to find another one and and, and keep growing that, um, but. Uh, you know, I don't think in in the past that's always been a strength uh, of the Flyers. So it's exciting knowing that we have some some prospects that could develop into really high end goaltenders. In saying that, it's a, it's a pretty good goalie draft. There is depth at the goaltending position. Um, I think you'll see as soon as the first one goes, there's going to be a, a string of them go. Um, but there is some depth in that position, and, and typically we we've always tried to take a goalie. Now, now if they all go, then you're not just drafting a goalie to draft a goalie. You're, um, but if there's some depth, so I, I, I would assume at some point we'd have a chance to get one. For Danny or Brent, I, I know it's the best player available pretty early in the draft for you guys, but is there an area that maybe you guys want to replenish a little bit later uh, in the draft? Um, like we said, we got we got some bunch of different positions. You know, We're not that deep in any position. A right wing, I guess you could say that we're, we have depth, but again, there's some quality players, and if it's the best player significantly, then we'll, we'll have another right winger. But. Um, but yeah, no, we we have some holes to fill, and and we'll we'll evaluate that. It's always if it, if it comes and the players are equal and our guys are 50-50, maybe we go by position. But we do our list and we try to stick by it as best we can. And we have to be careful too. Again, we discussed that earlier about three, four, five years down the road, the roster is going to be completely different. So you, you have to be careful diving into that too much. Can you guys share a little bit of? What's going on behind the scenes and the conversations that you guys are having with your scouts? Is this like multiple times a day? They're like, "Hey, listen, I think we need to like move this guy on our list." Like that kind of massaging of of your list. Yeah, no, we had uh, it's a little longer. We decided to do the um, our final meetings right after the combine, just so Yoke didn't have to go back and forth from Europe four times. But um, so yeah, they spent the whole week together in Buffalo, and then the whole week last week here. And it got fairly heated there. I think I had to shut it down the last day uh, just to get everybody away from each other and take a few days, take the weekend to come back. So, and I spoke to pretty much every other day. I've spoken to guys, and they want to tweak certain things. And uh, there's certain things I didn't like at the time, but you let slide, and then I can adjust it as I want to. But um, just the way it works. And, and we'll continue to discuss certain players and um, right up until the draft. But you know, our list is in pretty good shape right now, and I think there's probably – I'd say 90% complete, and then I think there will be some tweaks um, through some final interviews, and also so just some 
last minute information sometimes or or just strong feelings you know especially some of the guys in the later rounds that you know we want guys that really want to fight for somebody I don't want to just take a name just because he's on your list like if so, someone needs to have some passion about the player for me when you're drafting a player late how much Do you more questions? was changed in this last week like, like, how much will it how like how much can it what sort of information was significantly changed something uh sometimes it's off ice scenarios sometimes it's uh injury related uh we'll get further you know we find out certain things at the combine or through and we get uh, mri information for our doctors and they express concern or green light it whatever um but there's also some you know our strength guys they spend a lot of time watching all the the workouts up there get all the data and they run it and they have some concerns about certain body types of certain players and whether they can get stronger gain weight who are great athletes who aren't and we have a we're drafting we're, we're not the nfl so we're drafting kids when they're 17 18 years old and You've seen them all. They're, some of these kids are they're boys. So um, as long as our, our guys are comfortable that we can work with them, get them stronger, and hopefully become NHL players one day, then, then we'll draft them. And, and in some cases, it's, it's a lost cause. Like they're just too small or too thin or, uh, or not athletic. And you know, when you're talking about a, a player that may be a below average skater at this point, if it's just simply strength related, then we can work with that. But if, it's fun, if he's fundamentally flawed and just not very athletic, then it's a tough road to overcome. Danny, there's been some speculation around the league um, that you guys may potentially even pick up another first round pick before the draft. Obviously, you can't predict what's going to happen, but do you have any optimism that you guys could potentially hit the draft with three first rounders rather than just two? If someone wants to give us another pick, we'd take it, gladly take it. Um, uh, you know, we're having discussions with with different team. Um, you know, I, I probably say it's not likely, but we're we're definitely looking at every avenue and um, I, I would love to give another jolt to our amateur scouts to, to dive in, in even deeper in our list um, you know we're, we're trying no doubt about it but um, you know you need a dancing partner to, as well so um, I, I don't know if it's realistic Especially early on, I think we we will dive deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Try to find, you know, we'll ask our guys to find something. There's got to be a difference somewhere. So it's kind of go back to um, videos, to their charts, to the interviews. So you try to just get deeper into those two players and find the one that can make one trait that can make the difference. Um, that's kind of my approach with it more than, especially early in the, in the draft, more than the position that they play in. So that's like last resort? I, I, I would prefer that, you know, it doesn't come down to just position. I'd rather have our guys find a trait that separates the two. Danny, you, you, you mentioned being open for business and willing to listen on anyone. Did you notice a considerable uptick in once you said that, like in terms of interest from your players? Um, I, I've seen an uptick probably this week. I think it felt like the guys are getting down to business a little bit more, you know, getting inside what the 10 day window to the draft. So um, I, I, I'd have to say this week was probably uh, a time where I started getting uh, more uh, return calls.